So we've been here two and a quarter years. Yeah. This is my two and a quarter anniversary. Two and a third. Two and a third years. Two, three summers, two winters. And so far, the mantra that was, we've been told since we first landed still holds true. This isn't normal. It's not normal winter, not normal summer. I think the first winter was milder than normal. Last one we had the snowmageddon. They say this one's supposed to, according to Almanac, I think this one's supposed to be even more so. And uh, frankly, we've, this is the first really hot summer we've had up here. And I'm, I don't like it. I wish y'all would change it. I need y'all to fix that. All right, it is time for us to get started. There we go. Now we're cooking. All right, we're going to be in Mark chapter 1. We started, I was telling Jan, it was like three weeks ago, uh, due to my uh, extraordinary planning skills. And I say that with all humility. I'm the most humble, one of the most humble people I know. Um, due to my extraordinary planning skills, we had the introduction three weeks ago. And now we're getting it. <laughs> and then we had uh, Fifth Sunday with uh, fellowship and no evening services. And then we had First of the Month with small group and no evening services. And so now, when even I've forgotten what I said three weeks ago, we're going to start in the Gospel of Mark. By way of reintroducing the introduction, uh, here's some, a few things that Mark likes to emphasize in his gospel. The cross, of course. Uh, discipleship, it's, it's all about following Jesus, studying Jesus, becoming like Jesus. He focuses more on uh, the fact that Jesus teaches more than, than the content of Jesus' teaching. Not that he doesn't quote Jesus, doesn't, doesn't have sections of Jesus' teaching. But he, he spends more time than the other guys saying Jesus gathered, there was a crowd gathered and Jesus taught. So he, fo he focuses more on the fact of his teaching. One of the key aspects of, of uh, Mark's gospel is the messianic secret. Uh, it's that, that uh, mysterion, the, 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 uh, the gospel, the good news that has been withheld until now. That thing in which the ancients long to look into, the angels long to look into. Um, that thing with the prophecy, the prophets were, were pointing to. So uh, up until Christ came, God's big plan, his ultimate plan was secret, a mysterion, and now that Christ is here, the mystery is being revealed, and so that's part of his, what he focuses on. And also the deity of Christ, uh, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is uh, fully, uh, fully, fully human, also fully God, and uh, if that's well beyond my ability to fully comprehend, I, I can intellectually understand that what the words mean, and put the words together, but to explain how a person can be fully God and fully human is beyond me. But anyway, that's one of the things he likes to focus on in his gospel as well. So, uh, open your Bibles. We won't have many passages, if any, on the screen. So open your Bibles to Mark chapter 1 and we'll begin. Let's start with a prayer. Father, we thank you again for our day. And we thank you for the privilege of coming together to spend time in this word. We pray that you would bless this study in Mark's gospel, that we might hear Mark's heart, that we might hear your mystery being revealed to us uh, yet again. Let us hear it fresh with fresh ears and fresh hearts. And let us once again be in awe of the love you have for us and the, the countless ways in which you express it. Help us to appreciate the sacrifice that you made when you asked your son to be our sacrifice. The, the selflessness that he exhibited when he was without sin and yet took our sins to the cross. And the, the good news we have of a home with you through faith in Jesus and his sacrifice and his blood. Help us to be those who live that every day of our life, who make decisions based on that confident expectation. And Father, when it's our turn, let us be those who experience that redemption as well. We offer this prayer in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, let's go to Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. We're going to cover a few verses here for our beginning. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, I'm sorry, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you 
who will, repay, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. So the gospel is described as a new beginning. And Mark writes in verse 1, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ. This is not quite as, uh, uh, Michael, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Can you turn, turn me down just a little bit? It's, it's not quite the, uh, the, the borrowing from Genesis 1-1 that John does. In the beginning was the Word and the Word. It, but it is very much a point back to a beginning, the beginning in the gospel. So just as in Genesis 1-1, God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning, so God is beginning a new creative work in the gospel about Jesus Christ. So Mark sees this as a fresh start, uh, a, a new beginning, just as creation was a new beginning uh, in, in Genesis 1-1. And what's it, so gospel, what, what does gospel mean? Good news. So this is the beginning of the good news. Was, was good news... Did anybody else have good news besides the gospel writers in the first century, first century Palestine? Was there anybody else looking for good news? Did anybody else want to hear good news? Was, there, was good news something that you sought for? Uh, the, the idea of good news, gospel, was not unique to Christianity. There's a, a calendar inscription that's been located from around 9 BC, and it celebrates the birthday of Octavian. Uh, the Emperor Octavian. And the inscription on the calendar says around 9 BC, the birthday of the God was for the world. Well, okay. Let me catch up. The birthday of the God, this is Octavian is the God, small g, was for the world the beginning of joyful tidings, the beginning of good news. So, Everybody's looking for good news. Everybody wants good news. Everybody wants to hear good news. And so the Romans thought if we celebrate the birthday of the emperor, then this is good news. The birthday of our emperor was for the world, the beginning of good news, of joyful tidings. So aren't we glad the whole world gets to be under Octavian's rule because he's a wonderful, masterful leader? He brings us happy days and good tidings. He brings us victory in battle and conquest wherever we go. Aren't we glad that we threw our, our, our vote for him? Aren't we glad that, that, we're, that he's our leader? Now, there is a fundamental difference between the good news that Octavian's birthday is here and the good news of the gospel. In uh, fact, well, what would that be? What, what's, what would be the biggest difference you know of between celebrating Octavian's birthday as good news and celebrating Christ's arrival as good news. We're all sweltering under the heat, aren't we? I, th I thought that was a softball. Somebody, somebody bat that back at me. So Christ is coming and there's a new beginning in that. There's the good news in the new beginning. All right. I'm sorry? Was predicted? Yeah, not a lot of prophecies about Octavian becoming, becoming uh, emperor. Uh, are there, what about... So, <laughs> thank you, yeah, yeah, salvation. I mean, can Octavian provide salvation? Is, is his good news salvation or is it just that he was a, a powerful emperor? Do you still feel the ramifications in your world today? In, in your everyday world, do you feel Octavian's rule back in 9 BC? Do you have, do you have any expectation of eternal home in heaven through Octavian's rule in 9 BC? And, and that's really the difference between these two good news, these two not gospels. The world, if it looks for good news, has to look back at its past for good news. But we really had a good emperor in Octavian, didn't we? Hallelujah for him. We, we can celebrate. What, wasn't he great? Wouldn't we like to have those good old days back again with another? Can we have another Octavian, please? The world has to look back for its good news. You and me as Christians in the Bible can look future for our good news. 
that's really kind of what this morning's message was about, that, that long, the long game for wealth. What good is it for man to inherit the world and lose his soul? I mean, what good is it to have all the material wealth in the whole world, short game, greedy game, and lose the greatest wealth of all time, which is a home in heaven? I honestly don't care if the, if the streets are gold and the, and the gates are pearl. Couldn't care less. They can be, they can be a wrap for all I'm concerned, a pearl wrap that really looks good. As long as I'm in heaven with God and not in hell, I'm good with that. So if you've ever, now some of you are too young for, to play this game, but some of us aren't, uh, the good old days. Oh, the good old days. You know, uh, whatever, whatever was better back in the good old days. The, the cars were faster, the hair was thicker, the, 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 the food was better, I, whatever. The world has to look back for its good news. We get to look forward to our good news. And you think about, um, have, a, have, a really, have a really good friend who, who's gone through this wonderful transformation from being a guy who, uh, just a guy who's just gets deeper and deeper and deeper into his faith. You, you know, you know the, the, someone who's just in a constant faith journey, someone who doesn't get, get uh, lazy and doesn't get, get comfortable, he just keeps tr trying to dig a little more and dig a little more. And I remember when we first started having conversations about heaven, he was like, man, I don't want to go. And this guy loves, this guy's a song leader at the church where he worships. He, he loves music, he loves singing. He says, I'm not sure I want to spend eternity just singing songs. That, that, that was his view of heaven. I'm, I'm not, as much as I love worship, I, I, I want to go hunting some. I want to go do some other things. I'm not sure I want to go worship, you know, for eternity. And that was his view of heaven. And, and not only that, his, God had given him a beautiful family and uh, a career that, he, that, 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 that supported his family well, hobbies that he enjoyed. I mean, he, God had really blessed him. And he's like, I'm not sure. I, I, I know what, I, basically, I don't know if he would, I, I want to be fair. I'm not sure he would give me a thumbs up if I said his, his basic attitude was, I know what I've got here and I'm not sure what, I, what that future's gonna be like, but I think that's kind of what he was saying. I've got it so good here, and I, this I know. And that, I, I, I know the promises, but I don't know what, what heaven's like, so I'm, I'm gonna stick with what I do know, because I'm not sure what's out there. To watch him make a complete transfer to, I'm, I'm ready. You know, God's blessed me richly, it's wonderful, there's a lot of great things here, but boy, nothing's gonna compare to when we get home to heaven. And that's really what, what you and I have as Christians, God's blessed us richly here on earth. This is a blessing to come here tonight, isn't it? Uh, it's hot, and who wants to get dressed back up again and come back and get outside? And, but really to come together and, and to spend time with brothers and sisters who share the same faith and the same expectation and the same confidence and, and trust in the same Lord and to spend time in the same gospel together, to, to hear reassurance and, and to hear the promises yet again of this new beginning we have in Christ, that's a blessing. And, and don't you imagine the, the, the folks from the Ukraine Bible Institute would love to have the comfort that you and I have and the security and the safety that you and I have. And other people in different places of the world today would love to have the privilege that you and I are enjoying right now tonight. And so we have wonderful great blessings, but nothing is compared to what we have in the future. So we have uh, the beginning of good news. The Bible looks to the future. Now, if you look in verse 2, Mark instantly quotes from an Old Testament prophet, right? He's instantly quoting from the prophet Isaiah. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I'll send my messenger ahead of you. This is, Isaiah wrote this, this prophecy, or Isaiah spoke this prophecy some 600 years prior to Jesus' ministry. And Isaiah was looking to the future. For the voice of one calling in the desert. Other translations say wilderness. It, it's no man's land. So who is this one? So he's saying way back 600 years ago, Isaiah said that this new beginning would be marked by a prophet who will come and prepare the way for the Lord. Who's that? I'm sorry? John the Baptizer, right? John the Baptizer, he's coming going to prepare the way for the Lord. Um, and he's, he comes as uh, one, uh, a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, and he paves the way for Jesus Christ. And so here we have the beginning 
Um, we have this wonderful event that's on the horizon, but there's going to be a precipitating event. There's going to be something that kickstarts that. How many remember the moon landing? Anybody remember seeing the moon landing? Do you remember watching the rocket take off? A big old plume of smoke and just the rocket just flying up. and That was the prelude, right? Without the rock, rocket taking off, nobody's going to be walking on the moon. And then we waited while they made it to the moon and while they ordered the moon and while they got in the lander. lander and, and then the one they finally got down. But the rocket was the prelude. Well, that's John the Baptizer. We've got a great event coming, there's a Messiah arriving, but the prelude to that is John the Baptizer who comes and prepares the way. And then verse 3, there's all the ingredients in verse 3 for a true and lasting gospel. I'm sorry, verse 1. Verse 1, what do you see in there for, if, if, you have a, if you're writing a recipe for the gospel, you're going to write a recipe. Here's how you make a true and lasting gospel. Not, not the birthday of an emperor, but a true and lasting gospel. What, res, what ingredients do you see for a true and lasting gospel in verse 1? I'm sorry? Yeah, deity. All right. Okay. It's, it's good news that we have, we have the beginning of the good news about who? Jesus. The beginning of the good news about Jesus. Greek, uh, Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Yeshua or Joshua. And both names mean Yahweh is salvation. God is salvation. So we have the good news about Jesus. And we talked this morning about names mean things. Emmanuel, God with us. Barnabas, son of encouragement, uh, you're, you're Paul, and on this rock, I'll, I'll, you know, you're Paul, and on this rock, I'll build my church. Now he's talking about the confession Paul made, or Peter, I'm sorry, not Paul, Peter. So names mean things. So we have Jesus, who is the Greek version of God, uh, the salvation of God. So the good news about Jesus. And Jesus is the who? Son of God. He's also the Christ. What does it mean to be the Christ? What does Christ mean? The anointed? The same as the, the, the Hebrew version of Messiah. What does it mean to be the anointed one? I'm sorry? The chosen. the chosen one. He's the selected one. He's the one that's been set apart. He's the marked out one. This is the one whom God the Father chose before the creation of the world to be the solution for our sin problem. That's what it means to be the Christ. That's what it means to be the Messiah. Now what's interesting is he, he has always been the Christ. Since before the beginning of the world, he's always been the Christ. He's been the one chosen to be the Savior. But he has some things ahead of him before he can actually fulfill that role. What, what is, as, as we read Mark 1.1, 1, 1, he's, he's Jesus, he is uh, God, the salvation of God. He is the anointed of God. He is the Son of God. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. He's the beginning of the good news, or at least the beginning of the good news about Him. But He's got something left to do before He can be the, the Savior. He's already the anointed, always been the anointed. He's always been the Christ. He's always been the picked one, the selected one. But he's not quite ready yet to be the Savior. What does he need to do to be the Savior? What's, what, what's yet to be fulfilled? Die on the cross. He's got to be tempted in every way. He's got to overcome the temptation. He's got to submit to the persecution. He's got to submit to being put on the cross. And we sing the song, he could have called 10,000 angels. He could have called a legion of angels to bring him down off the cross. He could have come down anytime he wanted. But he had to stay on the cross and die our death. And that's when he became the Savior. 
So he's the anointed, he's the selected one, he's the Messiah. And so before the creation of the world, God the Father decided he would be the king and deliverer. So it's the good news about Jesus, Jesus who is the Christ. The good news about Jesus who is the Son of God. This is, by the way, Son of God is a major emphasis in Mark's gospel. We talked about this just a minute ago. As the Son of God, he enjoys an eternal relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, with, with God the Father. There, there, there was a, a, a teaching of early in the church that Jesus really wasn't deity. And the idea, I think the teaching came out of trying to rationalize fully God, fully human. Tr- trying, trying to wrap a human mind around a, a, a divine concept. Which is great to a point. I mean, that, that's why we're here tonight, is trying to wrap our human minds around some divine concepts. But it becomes detrimental when we have to minimize the divine concept so that a human mind can fully comprehend. Does that make sense? In other words, it, it, it's, it's a productive effort as long as we allow the divine concept to remain divine. And, and acknowledge that, that because it is such, we may not ever, this side of eternity at least, we may not, we may not ever fully comprehend that. Like I said earlier, I can understand what the words mean. Uh, he's fully God and fully human. But to really embrace that, there's some challenges there. And so I think some people tried to kind of bring that divine concept down to where we could make it manageable. And there were several different schools of thought that came from that. One was that uh, Jesus swooned on the cross. He didn't die because after all, if he's fully God, then he's eternal. And if he, how can an eternal being die? Uh, another was that uh, the eternal uh, Christ uh, separated from the, the physical Jesus before he died on the cross so that the Christ could avoid death and the physical person Jesus died, but the eternal Christ did not. Uh, and I don't want to be unkind to the people who thought that up. I'm sure they're smarter than I am. But the problem comes when we try to take a divine concept and, and bring it down to the point where the human mind can, can fully copy and explain it. I don't know about you, but I kind of like having a God that's bigger than what I can explain. If, if, if God ever gets small enough that my mind can fully wrap around him and completely understand him, then I'm thinking he's going to be way too small to God for what I need. Does that make sense? And so, so I find comfort in the divine. I find comfort in the fact that I can only take my understanding so far, and then after that I just have to trust God for the rest of it. I, I don't know how an eternal being died on the cross. I can't, I can't tell you that. But I, I don't know how he can be fully God and fully human. I can't tell you that. But the Bible says it. I believe it. And so that, here's the idea of the Son of God. He is the Christ. He is Jesus. He is the salvation of God, and he is the one who's always had uh, the old, the, 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 there was a song that was started to try to refute that uh, idea that there was a time that, that when, Jesus, when Jesus was a created being, and there was a song basically, I, I wouldn't begin to try to sing it, even have the notes, but basically the line of the song is, there was never a time when Jesus was not. And that goes way back. There was never a time when Jesus was not. So not only is he eternal, he is God the Son, the Son of God, he's also our visible manifestation of what God, what God looks like. And I don't mean his physical features. I mean, what does, what does God, how does God interact with his people that are made in his image? Jesus is the representation of that. We see how God interacts with us and that we understand the Father through Jesus. So the point here is that we have a new beginning in Jesus Christ. Thoughts? Anybody? You haven't, I don't know that I've squelched any conversation so far, but I don't want to pass up an opportunity if somebody has something they want to say tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Right. He's so big, and and we need to get comfortable not only with a, with a big God, but a, a God that's bigger than what, than what I can fully explain. Right, yeah. And if you come from a, a position, thank you for that, if you come from a position that, that is not uh, religious, that doesn't, 
If you come from a family, if you come from a tradition, a heritage that's not accustomed to contemplating the divine, then I ought to be able to put everything in a petri dish and figure it out. And if I can't put it in a petri dish and figure it out, then there must be something wrong with the experiment, not with me, or not with the concept I'm trying to explore. And so if you come from a tradition or a family that, that is not accustomed to contemplating the divine, that's a tough concept to, to grasp. So we, we need to remember and teach that God is, uh, my God is so great, he is so big. New beginning. Is it possible to be a Christian? Is it, is it possible to become a Christian and remain unchanged? Anybody want to do that? Yeah, okay. What has to change to become a Christian? If I'm outside of Christ and I become in Christ, hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, okay? All that's taken place. Is that all the change needs to take place? If not, what else needs to take place? Change your heart and mind. The, it, it requires a difference in how you look at the world. It requires a difference as, as who's in the driver's seat. You remember the bumper sticker, God's my co-pilot? Or Jesus my co-pilot? You ever, you ever see that? You, they're popular for a while. That was too many years ago to count. And then somebody came out with one and goes, if Jesus is your co-pilot, you're in the wrong seat. What does it mean to be Lord of your life? Co-pilot or pilot? You got to change your heart. You got to change your mind. You got to change the way you think. And, and this, if, if you think about it, someone who wasn't raised in, in a religious tradition and someone who comes into that, it's even more profound. When we make God and loving God our most important relationship, only then do our other relationships come in line. If my most important relationship is Jan and I love her with, with everything I have, that's not where God needs it to be. If my most important relationship is my kids, my grandkids, my job, my hobby, only when God becomes the most important relationship do we finally begin to put all the other relationships in their proper perspective. Only when we start focusing more on joy and worrying less about happiness do we find God's true purpose for us in life. Does that make sense? That's another one of those long-term ideas versus short-term. Start focusing on joy instead of worrying about happiness. Do we understand our true purpose? And do we understand the true purpose of the blessings God gives us? One of the best ways to turn God's blessing into a curse is to focus on happiness. You take any blessing God's given us. Just, just uh, I have, this is probably dangerous. Throw out a blessing, a blessing from God. Children, okay. If I'm more focused on happiness than I am in joy, how can I pervert that relationship, that blessing to where it come, becomes a curse? The blessing of children. Not everybody gets that blessing. Can you focus on happiness rather than joy and turn that blessing into a curse? Any thoughts? Put your kids above on a pedestal higher than God and my kids' happiness and therefore whatever they want, they get. And then if they mess up, then the last thing I want my child to do is to have to pay a penalty for that. So I'm going to try to cover that up and try to smooth it over because they're not going to be happy if they're in detention. They're not going to be happy. If, I'm not going to be happy if they're in jail. So I need to make sure and 
they don't have any problems and they don't have any bumps in the road. Um, God gave intimacy between a husband and a wife as a blessing. If my only focus is happiness, can you see how that might be turned into a curse? Going outside my marriage? How many people are abusing intimacy as a gift from God by exercising it outside of marriage? You know, the old saying, we're supposed to be people who love people and use things, but in the world loves things and uses people. Intimacy is one of those perfect places to see that. Um, food. Can you... You can turn any blessing into a curse if you take it outside of where God means it to be. And one of the ways to do that quickest is, is to be focused on happiness rather than focused on joy. How can, I, how can you be joyous in the tough times? It's hard to be happy. How can you be unhappy and find joy? I don't like the heat. I don't like how hot it is. I don't like how late it is. I don't like how I feel. I don't like COVID. I don't like. Is, how would I find joy in that? Or can you? <laughs> yeah, I've got God. I've got God. And I have, a, I have a promise. This is my wilderness wandering. This is my temporary. This is my, this is my sojourn. My, my home is in heaven where COVID and all these frustrations are gone. All right. Uh, it's when we lay our hopes of salvation in the blood of Christ, then we can put away the, the religious struggles that we have on, on, am I good enough? Am I doing enough? Have I earned my way to heaven yet? So new beginning. Uh, it's a new beginning. And the gospel is a turning point. Let's read a few more verses. Mark 1, start verse 4. And so John, there's our, ask question, there's our answer to the question, of who's this one preparing the way? And so John came, baptizing in the desert region, in the wilderness, and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locust and wild honey. And this was his message. So here's the message John proclaimed, verse 7. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So the gospel's a turning point. Now Isaiah, going back to verse 3, told of a voice of one calling in the wilderness, or one crying out in the wilderness, in the desert. There, now, there was a, a time, we said that was like 600 years prior to Christ's earthly ministry. There was a time of silence between the Testaments, between Malachi and, and Matthew. Roughly how long was that? How long was God quiet? 400 years, yeah. There was, there was roughly 400 years when the prophecy stopped, when the message stopped, when the communication stopped, when the connection, I mean, it's just like God gave him the silent treatment for 400 years. Well, now here we have the silent treatments come to an end. And the promise that was made in Malachi, that we've got this one coming, is being fulfilled. John is the one fulfilling it. Uh, and he's coming out to the wilderness as a new beginning. And like the prophet Elijah before him, John the baptizer wore a garment of hair and uh, with a leather belt around his waist. You can, uh, Elijah did, was reported to wear that in Ele uh, 2 Kings uh, chapter 1, verse 8. And John the baptizer came baptizing in the desert region, in the wilderness. He wore the same clothing, we already talked about that. And he preached a message of forgiveness of sins for those who would repent and be baptized in, into Christ. How important is repentance and seeking forgiveness from God? A 
highest importance? Yeah. For a Christian, it should be a highest importance. Is it, in, is it necessary? Can I get forgiveness? Can I be restored to a relationship with God without repentance? And if I can't, then what does repentance mean? What, if, if that's important, of highest importance, if I can't be restored to right, a right relationship with God without it, what does it mean to repent? What does repentance mean? I'm sorry? To, to turn away, to, to, to change directions, to, to, to turn. I'm, I'm, I'm living, I'm walking a self-centered, self-focused life. I'm self-directed. I'm Lord and master of my life. Uh, you know, the old uh, Frank Sinatra song, I'm, I'm doing it my way. Uh, I am in charge. I make the decisions, what I think is best and right. Repentance means what? Turning away from that. If, I am, if happiness is my highest goal and I'm using the blessings God gave me, whether it's intimacy or, or money, can money be taken beyond the blessing God intends it to be and become a curse? Absolutely. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So I've decided I've, I'm going to stop using my happiness as, as my motivator and my motive becomes glorifying God. I've got, I've, got to change, I've, got to, I've got to turn off the road I'm on and turn on to another road. So, so here's the, the turning point. And what's interesting is, over and over again, the wilderness is used as a turning point. Uh, in the Old Testament, the wilderness was a turning point. Uh, how did that look like? Well, God called the slaves out of Egypt into where? The wilderness, right? They asked for deliverance, so he takes them out into the wilderness. The wilderness is where God entered a covenant with the freed slaves, right? He takes them out in the wilderness, takes them out to Sinai. They camp around Mount Sinai, and God gives them a covenant there. The wilderness is where God taught his people to trust in him with for all their needs. How did he do that? Manna, quail, water from a rock. You take somebody out where there's nothing for them to eat, nothing for them to drink, and you say, okay, now you just trust me every day I'm going to give you something. You trust that every day I'm going to give you daily food. That's what Jesus prayed for, right? That happened out in the wilderness. The wilderness is where God prepared his people to possess the promised land. How do you do that? By learning to trust he's God. And if he says it, he'll do it. And if he tells you to do it, you do it. The wilderness is where the prophet Elijah emerged, calling God's people to fulfill uh, to uh, faithfulness and repentance. And so the Old Testament... Or the, the wilderness has always served as a turning point for God's people. It's always been a place of, of change, a place of, if you will, repentance for God's people. And now it's a turning point in the New Testament as well. Uh, Isaiah foretold of a voice of one calling in the desert, in the wilderness. And after 400 years of silence, we have that one who's come to prepare the way for the Lord. John the baptizer came in the desert region preparing a way, dressed like Elijah the prophet, a fulfillment of the prophecy in Malachi, a fulfillment of what Isaiah talked about. And the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to the wilderness to see him. They didn't book him at the uh, plaza and have him come into town and dress him up and clean him up and put him in some nice street, street clothes and put him up there to have his TED talk, <clears throat> they went out to the wilderness to see him. They went out to the wilderness. We're at a place of renewal, a place of turning, a place of repentance. And so they take him out in the wilderness. And that's where they faced a turning point. <clears throat> what was the message that John preached? A message of repentance and baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Now, the people who came out to listen to him had a choice. They can either hear the message, they can respond to the message, they can embrace the message, they can repent, and they can be baptized, or what? Or not? Was any of that what they were expecting when the Messiah came? Hey, let's go out to no man's land and listen to a crazy guy that eats bugs just like Elijah, the crazy guy back in the Old Testament who ate bugs, let's go listen to him. And he's going to tell us Jews who've always been in a right covenant with God that we have to do the same thing the Gentiles have to do, be, be immersed. We're clean, they're not. They have to be immersed to be cleansed, we don't. But he's going to tell us we have to do it too. Let's go, let's go do that. 
Yeah, that's fun. They had a choice. They could choose to accept the gospel or reject the gospel. They could repent and be baptized or they could go back to their normal lives. But if they do accept the gospel, they've got to turn away from that life they had before. It's one of the hardest parts for folks that, that become Christians. For some, one of the hardest things is to understand everything's different now. Everything's different. The way you think about things is different. The way you prioritize things is different. The way you value things is different. The way you approach life is different. The way, the way you approach relationships is different. The way you approach blessings, everything's different. And so they've got to come out and they've got to accept repentance and they've got to accept baptism. We've got five minutes. Okay, never mind. So John the baptizer was the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's the prelude. He's the opening act. He's the starter kit. And like the prophets before him, he pointed to the one more powerful than he, uh, mightier than he, some translations say, who will baptize with the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Ghost. And the gift of the Holy Spirit, like we talked about this morning in class, was one of the promises of the Old Testament associated with the Messiah's arrival. There's something going on about the Holy Spirit that had gone on before, and when the, when the Messiah comes, this something's going to go about and this, this something's going to happen, and we read about that in Ezekiel. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. God says in the very next verse, I'll put my spirit in you. So this is the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And it brings the Old Testament promises. It starts to bring the Old Testament promises to their ultimate fulfillment. And that's the mystery that's been revealed. There's our five-minute bell. So the gospel is not only a, a starting point, the gospel's a turning point. We have to be humble enough to realize that we're lost in our sins. We have to be humble enough to let somebody dunk us under water. Why do you suppose God picked dunking? I'm sorry? Cleansing, cleansing okay. A, a method of cleansing, a bath, okay, like a bath. Not the removal of, I'm sorry? It's like a trust fall, isn't it? Have you, anybody done a trust fall? Anybody get dumped on your trust fall? It's a trust fall. Not only that, it's a little humiliating, maybe too strong a word, humbling. Does it mess up your hair? Does it mess up your makeup? Does it mess up your clothes? I mean, can you come to church all put together and looking good and decide to be baptized and leave church come looking all put together and looking good? When, when you played in the pool when you were a kid, what was one of the games you played? We're going to dunk somebody? I mean, there, there's, there's a certain amount of humility that's required and trust to let somebody take you and dunk you underwater. I think God picked that on purpose. There's a beautiful imagery of the cleansing of washing. Then you know, the Bible also in, in, compares that with being buried in a tomb. He's submerged in water, buried in a tomb with Christ. If you've been buried with Christ like this, Romans. But it's a turning point. It's a way for us to turn. It's a way for us to change. It's a way for us to begin to, to, to look at life anew as those who are redeemed by Christ through the blood of the Lamb and the cross of Christ that was really ours. Two minutes. Any thoughts? All right. Let me just say this. Um, the Gospel of Mark is going to call you and me out into the wilderness. Whether you are a new Christian or whether you've been a Christian your entire life, if, if we come to the Gospel of Mark, I think the way the Holy Spirit inspired Mark to write it is going to call us out into the, our own wilderness, out into a place of turning, out into a place of transformation, out into a place of change, out of our comfort and into a relationship with trusting in God more than we ever thought was possible. And I pray that as we go through this journey together, Lord willing, that we'll accept the call to march out into the wilderness and accept the call to go through that transitional point and come out of the other side of the gospel study, maybe a little more transformed than we were when we went in. God bless you. We'll take a break. We'll come back and we'll worship here in just a few minutes.
that's not that's not a disciple's job to, to meet the disciples. So like if somebody came in in the evening, if yeah, it yeah. wasn't so, the so job, you, you that's come in from your day off doing your thing, and okay. then we're in Samuel's on Dirt Road and Dirt Street. Um, you wouldn't have to disciple to be a Christian to be used of God okay. because Jesus is watching you do the things that you're doing. Okay. And, and that's so what I was saying. That, yeah, that's what he's saying. I mean, yeah. you don't get the background yeah. understanding. That's what he's saying. And, and okay. so what, what, what I think what he's trying to do is, is try to avoid preacheritis. Okay. Uh, you know, is there a preacher right, yeah. Okay, so, so you're, you're we've following got me John and making me higher than, than yeah. He's dressed like Elijah, and he's out in the wilderness like Elijah, and he's eating locusts like Elijah, and he's, he's the fulfillment of Malachi, and the Old Testament prophecies. And, ooh, you know, John the baptizer, John the baptizer. No, 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 no. I'm lower than a slave. I'm, I'm, I'm lower than a disciple. I'm lower than a slave. This one's coming is so far superior to me. I can't even, I can't, I'm not even worth it. I'm not even worth it doing the slave job of untying the sandals. Okay. Don't worship me. There's something better coming along. Exactly. Does that make sense? That makes, that yeah. clears it up okay. perfectly <laughs> for me. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, no new announcements, so we're just going to go ahead and jump into the songs. It's for all the kiddos. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. So, so what do you see when you look at this picture? What do you see when you look at this picture? Hopefully, most of you see a man who's clinging to a rocky shoreline reaching out to rescue another man who's struggling in the water. I hope that's what you see. But there's a story of a, of a little child who had gone to the museum with her daddy. And she was looking at the picture. And she looked at her daddy. 
And this is supposed to be illustrating rescue the perishing and caring for the dying. And studied the picture for a little while and then asked Daddy this question. Daddy, is that man trying to save the other, di- other guy? Or is he just shaking hands with him? Let's pause for a prayer. Almighty God, we we give you all praise and glory as being the creator of all things, the one who uh, sustains your creation, the one who placed the stars in their their rightful place and assigned them their place and gave them a name, the one who set the boundaries for the sea, the one who set the seasons, the one who gives us every beat of our heart and every breath in our lungs. And we give you all praise and glory, not only as our creator, but also as the one who prepared and, and planned a salvation for us that we might have a remedy for this call, the sins that we've created and for the separation that's created between you and me. We're thankful so much for the love you have for us, for the reconciliation you have for us, for the message of redemption. And we pray, Father, that we might be your children. We pray for our church members and those who are struggling. We pray for our church leaders. We lift up our, our civic leaders, our national leaders, and entrust them as well as us into your care. And we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So is this a guy who's reaching out his hand to save the lost? Or is he just simply shaking hands with them? That's a question that we ought to ask ourselves as Christians. I submit to you that all of us have people within our connections within our family, within our friends, within our schoolmates, within our co-workers, who we may be shaking hands with them when really what they need is someone to hold out a hand of salvation. We may be saying, hi, how are you? How's the family? How's the kids? How's school? How was your weekend? When what we really need to be saying is, how are you with God? Are we holding out a hand to save the lost, or are we just shaking hands with them? In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, we're told why Jesus came to this world. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. In Jude 22, or verse 20 and following, But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of, of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt, snatch others from the fire, and save them. Uh, The challenge that I place before me this week, and the challenge I place before you as well, is to ask ourselves, when we shake a hand, is that all this person needs from us? Or do they need a hand that reaches out into the sea and pulls them out of the waves before it's too late? If there's any way that we can serve you in a way this church can be a blessing to you, if there's, you need a hand to reach and pull you out of the waves, won't you tell us how we can serve you? Let's stand. Let's sing. We read of a place that's called heaven. It's made for the pure and the free. These truths in God's word he has given. How beautiful heaven must be. How beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. Fair haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. Pure waters of life there are flowing, and all who will drink may be free. Rare jewels of splendor are glowing. How beautiful heaven must be! How beautiful heaven must be! Sweet home of the happy and free, fair haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. 
Is there anyone here that needs to partake the Lord's Supper? Okay, let's be seated. We'll sing the song and then have the communion. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior, bearing shame and scoffing rude in my place condemned he stood sealed my So at this time um, is an opportunity for those that were unable to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning uh, to think back and contemplate what God has done for us, what Christ you know, did for us, and then just remember that sacrifice. That's how we pray. Our Father who are in heaven, I'm most hallowed be thy name. Lord, we are so grateful for thy plan of salvation, for the plan that thou has had for mankind since the beginning of, of the world, since the beginning of creation. Lord, we are so grateful for thy son and his willingness to be part of that plan, for his willingness to, to die on that cross. And for those who are about to partake of this communion feast, we pray that they'll focus on the bread and the fruit of the vine, that they'll focus on what the, those emblems mean, that we're so grateful for his flesh, the torment it went through, for being exposed on the cross. We just pray that those particularly partaking of this this bread will be able to focus on that portion. We pray this all through the Holy Son of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, may we see the hands. Shall we bow, uh, bow again? Our Father in heaven, we come before the prayer again just to offer our humble, our humble gratitude for what thy Son has done for us. And we just pray for that, those that are able to, to partake of this fruit of the vine that they will, will understand and remember the importance of it. Remember the importance of thy Son's blood being shed on that cross. And we pray this all through the Holy Son of Jesus Christ. Amen. We also will have some time now if there's any who desire to make a contribution to the work of the church, and we'll have a prayer before that offering. Our Heavenly Father, again today we thank you for all that you bless us with. And again, we thank you that we 
have the opportunity and the ability that we can give and support the work of the, your church. And we offer this prayer in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> stand and sing our last song. I'm going to stand over here. <laughs> I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in Heavenly Father, humbly we come before you this evening thanking you for this another day that you've given us for a chance to meet once again on this Lord's Day to hear your message and uh, sing some songs and hymns. Watch over all of us uh, this week, especially the kids now that they're back in school. We ask the Lord you please keep everybody healthy and safe. And uh, watch over those members that we have that are sick or facing surgeries, recovering, or those that have recently lost loved ones. Comfort them as only you can. Lord, we thank you for <clears throat> our elders and their leadership. We thank you for David and his sermons and for uh, all the t volunteer teachers that we have and all the behind the scene volunteers. All of these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen.